Okay. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm so glad that we have such a great turnout. Uh, once again, we have Arthur Bergeron, who has been with us for forever, ever, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, who has joined us again today to talk uh, talk about um, rules and yeah. kind of Elder Law 101. Yep. Yep. Elder Law 101, and um, it is a pleasure to have you back again, Arthur. And um, without any further ado, I'll turn the floor over to Arthur and. Welcome once again. And Joyce, thank you. thank you always for your hospitality. It's always great coming here. The people are so wel welcoming here. And thank you all for coming um, to, uh, to this, the latest installment of the, the Council on Aging presentations that I've been doing now here, I think since 2006. I think this is actually 10 years. It's been a, it's been a long time. I'm starting to age in place here. I come over. Okay, so before I start, I got one Martha's Vineyard story. So I was here two weeks ago, and I was driving from Megatown on the Vineyard Haven Road, and I'm driving along. Car slows down in front of me. Guess what? There's a turkey walking across the road. This is no big surprise, right? So I'm watching the turkey walk across the road, and then I realize the turkey is walking in the crosswalk. The whole way, within the lines, all the way to the other side, and then takes a right. And I, said, and I call my wife, I'm breaking up laughing. I said, I said, in Martha's Vineyard, even the turkeys are polite. This is like uh, an incredible thing. Did right? you I just, take a picture? I, yeah, I, did I take a picture? On the vineyard, I was going to run out and take right. No, I should have. I thought about that after. Should I take a picture? Next one I will. I'll be ready now. I'll be ready. So, um, this is the annual update of Elder Law 101. Um, so this is kind of like all of the basic things that you kind of need to know. Um, if you are 65 or older and slowing down and you're like my friends Frank and Mary, you've all met Frank and Mary, their children Peter, Paul and Mary Jr., they never age. They will just be with us just forever. Um, and we're gonna, so we're going to talk about what they need to be doing or what they need to be dealing with as people who are over 65 and retiring and their basic situation, you know, they want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. Their house hasn't gone up in value. I know I should have. Right, because yours are all going up in value, right? Values are going back up on Martha's Vineyard. This is very exciting, but we're still assuming their house is worth uh, $300,000, that Frank has an IRA worth 150, that they have an annuity worth $100,000. Bank accounts worth 75, total 625. So they're certainly not fabulously wealthy, but they're okay. Frank's on, uh, on Social Security plus a pension, totaling $2,000. F folks, there are, there are chairs way over here on the left, if you'd like to grab some of those, and then there are handouts. Um, and then um, Mary's income is half of Frank's, $750. And so they're doing okay. Um, and if they're talking to me and they're coming in, one of their first questions is, or oftentimes people will hear will say, well, don't I need a will? Um, and the answer is no. If you're Frank and Mary, and your children are Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., even if they're not Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., and your estate plan is to, that if one of you dies, the other one's going to get everything, and if the both of you have died, everything goes to the kids. You actually don't need a will, but we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. What you do need, you have to have those three things. You have to have a health care proxy, a power of attorney, and a MOLST. So how many people know what a MOLST is? Raise your hands, please. That's not good. We've talked about these. You're forgetting. We're getting old here. Right? <laughs> We're going to talk about those, okay? So your healthcare proxy, first and foremost, because any one of us, any one of us, at any time can have an accident, have a stroke, fall down, have something happen where we can't be making medical decisions. Um, and at that point, no one can make a medical decision for you. No one. Your spouse cannot is not legally empowered to make a medical decision for you. Now, a lot of doctors cheat on this. Right? And nurses, and they'll kind of let it go, but they're not supposed to. And you know, in a more and more litigious society, they're going to let it go less and less. So you need to have somebody that you've designated who can make medical decisions for you if your doctor says that you can't make them yourself. And that's what a healthcare proxy does. It's very easy to do. You need two witnesses, right? The uh, don't need, it doesn't need to be notarized, doesn't need to be in front of a lawyer, right? The two witnesses can't be people who work in the hospital um, where you are, unless you're, they're related to you, or who work in the nursing home, unless they're related to you, for kind of obvious reasons, you know. Um, um, 
one of the reasons, the, one of the only reasons why people don't sign healthcare proxies as they get older is they get scared that their kids are going to stick them in a nursing home, right? Oh, they're going to stick me in a nursing home. And so the question is, if someone has been named as the healthcare proxy, can they stick you in the nursing home? The answer actually is no, they can't. No, they can't. And the reason is, while A, the decision to cause somebody to go to a nursing home is considered to be a health care decision, and therefore the proxy should be able to do this. B, if you refuse to do what the proxy says you should do, like go to the nursing home, there is a case that was decided a few years ago that said as far as the law is concerned, you revoked your proxy. And you always have the power to revoke your proxy. And so the court will actually, and so any nursing home that's paying attention will not allow you to be admitted, even if you're there with the kids and they're saying, she's crazy. And th that's not the question. The question is whether you want to be there, okay? So, so you don't worry about that. You can always, and you can always revoke your, your health care proxy. I've often given this example. So you're in the hospital room with your doctor and your proxy. And the doctor says, I think we ought to do this operation. And, and you say, well, I don't want it, right? But the doctor has already invoked the proxy because he said you're not competent anymore. And so your daughter who was there says, oh, I think we ought to do the operation. And you say, I don't want it. Right? Well, 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 as far as the proxy law is concerned, when you said I don't want it, that was a revo revocation of her proxy. Mm -hmm. And so the doctor can't do the operation. So you're not giving away everything by signing the proxy. But it is really important, really important. By the way, if the, if the proxy actually survives your death, for one and only one purpose. The proxy has the ability to give your body away after you're dead um, to the New England Organ Bank. So you want to make sure when you're talking to your proxy, right, that you've told him or her whether you want to give your body away <laughs> to the New England Organ Bank, because he or she has the power to do that. And actually, you're, if, you're, if you die in the hospital or in a, the, at the nursing home at Windermere, the body will not be released until, it, for the, to the funeral home or whatever, until the New England Organ Bank has authorized it, has called the hospital and said, yes, it's okay to release the body. We've checked with the proxy, or if they can't find the proxy, the person who is the personal representative, used to be called the executor of the will, and if there isn't a will, then they'll talk to next of kin, okay? So, so those, are, those are kinds of just random important things. The most, the, or medical orders for life-sustaining treatment, M-O-L-S-T, right, is the form that the Department of Health or Public Health has developed to replace the so-called DNR form, the Do Not Resuscitate form, uh, also called euphemistically the Comfort Care form. We all thought that was bizarre that they call it the Comfort Care form. But anyway, the point of the MOLS form is to allow you ahead of time to make a whole set of decisions that are really important. One, if you stop if your heart stops, do you want someone to start it again? Now, that's a really good question, you know, after you get to be a certain age, um, because the process of doing, of trying to get your heart to start again, involves kind of pressing through and typically breaking your ribs in order to push down on your heart, in order to get it to try to start, right? So it's really painful, right? So if it doesn't start again, then probably what you decided if you're going to have this thing done, is that your death is going to be really painful, right? So the question is, well, is it worth the risk, right? And, and you may, you know, and you want to talk to your doctor about this, among other things, because I, was, I did this presentation with one gerontologist who said she just saw some statistics that, that the percentage of people who are over 70 who, who undergo CPR and live more than 30 days is 5%. 5%, right? You may live for a little while, but you're not going to live for really long, and you, did, and you still had to go through this terrible thing. So, not that you don't want to, but you should, you should think about that, right? <laughs> Similarly with, with uh, intubation. Intubation, that is, if you have stopped breathing, have somebody stick a tube down your throat and into your lungs and start pushing air into it to get you to breathe. Not another pleasant thing, you know? And you may, it may be okay with you to have that done, but you want to kind of decide that. Um, the most, there were several other things on that same list. So do you want certain drugs administered? Do you want various things done to you? If otherwise, you're going to pass away, right? And, and I, this is the most important to me, do not hospitalize. Everybody, Frank and Mary, just about everybody I know, wants to die at home, 
Ideally, because God's going to hit them on the back of the head and they're going to die, right? But what if God hits them on the back of the head and they don't die fast enough and the ambulance shows up, you know? <laughs> the question is, at that point, you want to go to the hospital, right? Because if you go to the hospital, they will save you, right? They'll do everything they can to save you because doctors want to save people and because hospitals don't want to get sued, right? I used to be on the board of the, the uh, local hospital, Marlboro Hospital, I was on the board for a number of years. And at the monthly meetings, one of the things that we would talk about, the monthly meeting of the trustees, how many people died in our hospital this month, right? Because that's an important number. Because if a lot of people die, oh, next thing you know, the Department of Public Health is calling, and the Joint Commission, the Joint Commission, the, the federal uh, agency that, 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 that tests hospitals, right, to see what's going wrong at your hospital. So hospitals have a big incentive to save you once you get to the hospital. So if you want to die at home, you don't want to be hospitalized, okay? So now what do you do with this, if, with the most? You put it on your refrigerator. Put it on your refrigerator. The reason for that is what a most form is, and by the way, the most form uh, actually isn't really a form. For, they don't really care that you've signed it. They really care that the doctor has signed it. The doctor signs the most form, because technically the most form is a medical order to people farther down the food chain, nurses and, 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 and medics saying, here are the things that you do or don't do, right? And that way, because the doctor has said so, if you don't do, if they don't revive you, they can't get sued for it, right? So the place that you have to put it is on the refrigerator. Why is that? Because all of the ambulance service drivers have been trained when they walk into the house, if they see you on the floor, they look to the refrigerator. If there's no most form there, then they do whatever they're going to do because they're not going to like start searching through the drawers, you know. They're just they're in, a, in a hurry, right? So if you want one, keep it updated, put it on the refrigerator. One other thing, your proxy can always, always overrule anything that's on the most form, right? By the way, once again, parenthetically, there are no, there are no valid living wills in Massachusetts. There is nothing you can write down ahead of time that is going to, that is legally binding on anybody, right? Except this most form, which is signed by the doctor, okay? So whenever you've signed these living wills saying, this is how I want to be treated, it's all irrelevant. None of it's enforceable. The key is, what does the proxy say? So you want to make sure that you've talked to your proxy. The, the one thing that you may want to do, in addition to having your proxy signed, is maybe do some separate document, some separate written document to your daughter or your son or whoever's the proxy saying, look, here's how I really want to be treated. And basically, this, that, not that that's legally binding, it just gives them like moral cover <coughs> when they're dealing with the other symptom, other siblings. You know, this is what Ma really wanted. This is what Dad really wanted, okay? But that's a really important form. And the, and the alternative to that, if you're incapacitated, is somebody's got to go to the probate court down in Edgartown spend, oh, maybe $10,000 in legal fees because there's a ton of forms that have to be done and you've got hearings and all this stuff to get somebody appointed a guardian to act on your behalf. You don't want to go there. You know, these, the, 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 the health care proxy costs you nothing. It avoids all of those troubles. Power of attorney. The only other document you have to have. You have to have it. If you're incapacitated, you want somebody who can make legal decisions for you, who can sign your checks, who can deal with your bills, who can just deal with all, who can keep people from coming into your house if you don't want them to be in your house, you know? Someone who has legal power to do things that you can do. Um, typically, by the way, um, it, um, as opposed to healthcare proxies, which only become effective when your doctor says that you're incapable of making a medical decision, healthcare proxies typically come into effect immediately. They're immediately valid. But as opposed to a proxy where you've, you've, because you're incapacitated, you've like given away your power to make decisions, the, the power of attorney, you're naming someone else to do stuff, but you haven't given anything away yourself. You continue to be able to make all of your own legal decisions. You've just given someone else the power to do it too. Now sometimes people will say, well, but I don't want someone to be out there with a you have a power of attorney because they could like sell my house, you know, or you know take all my money from. And that's true. That's all true. Uh, and so, if you're concerned about that, oftentimes that's where you want the power of attorney to simply help be held by your lawyer. Have your lawyer hold the power of attorney. Give your lawyer instructions. Don't release this power of attorney unless you've determined 
that I'm incapacitated, or unless you've gotten a doctor's certificate or something. So you have the power of attorney in a place that's safe. But you need to have one. Now, what does it take to have a valid power of attorney? Do you need witnesses? No. Do you need notaries? No. Um, you only need a notarization um, if the attorney uh, is going to be authorized to sign a deed or a mortgage or another document that's going to get recorded in the registry of deeds, because the power of attorney itself would have to get recorded, and so it has to be notarized, right? Um, but as a practical matter, do you want it notarized? Yes. Now, the trouble with having come here for 10 years is that everybody knows my jokes. So, I, so I, I'm sorry if I'm repetitive, but I've done this before. I've said, my, my, my young daughter who was in high school, who by the way is getting married Memorial Day weekend, my, uh, my lawyer daughter, right? Once gave me a t-shirt when she was a little kid, said the good lawyer knows the law, the great lawyer knows the judge. Now, in the, in the case of powers of attorney, See, a few people haven't been here before. I'm always <laughs> glad that a few people have. Um, the, great, the thing about a power of attorney is that the judge of whether the power of attorney is valid is never really a judge, because you're not going to court with the power of attorney, right? It's like the guy at the bank, right? Or your insurance person, right? Or all these other people that you need to deal with. And, they, and you want the document, therefore, to just look really legal. And it's amazing to me, after all these years, how people see a seal you know, like a notary seal? They get all, oh, that's really a legal document. It's got a notary seal. So that's the only reason you're doing it. Only so it looks really serious, like a real legal document. So a couple of the only other things, I talked about real estate. The only thing is, in that power of attorney, if you're doing it, uh, among other things, because I told you to do it, because I want to make sure that someone has the ability on your behalf to restructure your assets if you need to qualify for mass health by giving them away to people, by giving them to people, then you want to make sure that you've given your attorney the ability to gift things, either to, uh, ideally to everybody, but in, in addition to giving things to themselves, especially if it's your spouse who is the power of attorney. I say that because many powers of attorney um, will have a provision regarding gifting, but it will restrict gifting and will say, my attorney can make gifts, but in an amount no higher than the federal uh, uh, um, tax amount, which I won't go into today, but it's $14,000 a year right now, right? Which is useless to me if you've got that power of attorney and now you need to qualify for mass health and so we need to move some assets or your house out of your name because now you've got this power of attorney but it says you can't, the attorney can't sign for you unless you're only giving away $14,000. It doesn't help me, right? So you want to make sure that's not in there. Um, Finally, join in several. Whereas your, your proxy, you can only name one person at a time. Power of attorney, you can name two people or three or four. And you can name them jointly because you don't trust the, any one of them and you want to make sure everybody signs off. Or jointly and severally so that every one of the people you name can act individually on your behalf. So that if one of them is, lives in San Francisco or is on vacation or whatever, there's somebody around who can always sign. So that's powers of attorney. If you don't have it and you're incapacitated and someone needs to move things on your behalf, conservatorship, 10,000 bucks, two or three months. If you're in a nursing home, right, and I've got to get a conservator appointed in order to move assets on your behalf, that's going to take me about three months. That's going to cost you $30,000 in nursing home fees by the time I get the conservatorship approved, right? Whereas the power of attorney, what did it cost you? 100 bucks, $200, cost you, you know, 300 cost you nothing, okay? So those are your important forms. Now, what about probate? When is probate necessary? Remember those, it, 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 let's see, let's see, may I have this example? So let, let's use this example. Here's Frank and Mary, right? Frank dies. Uh, does Frank's asset, do, does Frank's, does, do we have to go do probate regarding Frank's estate? Any, any, and raise your hands if you think we have to go through probate if Frank dies. Ah, uh, you're all wondering. The answer is no, because they own their home jointly. When you own something jointly, the legal effect of that is that each of you owns 100% of it. So if one of you dies, that interest evaporates. The other person becomes the sole owner, so you don't have to go through a probate. Um, the IRA, all IRAs, 401ks, all tax-deferred funds, which you may think are in your joint names, are not. They're, an IRA or a 401k can only be in one person's name, the name of the person who put the money in. Right? whose tax have got, has gotten deferred as a result of the fact that he or she put the money in. And so what you do in that case is you'll name a death beneficiary. So Frank would have named Mary in this case right, to be his death beneficiary only if Frank had forgotten to name her 
Or if, and this ha actually has happened to me several times, Frank named her, but she died first, and then Frank died. And so effectively, there's no named beneficiary. In that case, the asset goes into the estate. But otherwise, it doesn't. Um, annuities, are, if it was jointly held, then there's, there, there's nothing. If, it, if there's a jointly held bank account, there's no, there's no necessity for probate. Mary simply becomes the owner of everything. If Mary dies, however, uh, in that case, if she hasn't done some things, there would be a probate, right? Because the house would be just in her name. The IRA she probably would have taken care of. The annuity and the bank account would be just in her name. So they would, she would need, her kids would need to go through probate. And the reason for that is the probate process is the process of figure, is the, that, is, that is used to figure out who owns things that are owned by an individual when they die, right? So the fact that you have a will does not keep you from going through probate. The will simply says, here are the people who are going to become the owners after I die. If you don't have a will, the Commonwealth has already written a will for you. It's called the rules of intestacy, right? So, so you, you don't, a will doesn't get you out of probate, right? And as a matter of fact, the rules of intestacy of, in this case would be that if Frank died, Mary got everything, and if the two of them were dead, everything got divided among the three kids. So for them, Having a will doesn't change anything. It doesn't change how any of the distributions get made, right? So if they don't need a will, but if Mary dies, the question is, well, would she want a will? Well, if she's simply dividing things equally among Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., it doesn't make any difference, right? She doesn't need a will. So, but the time she might want to think about a will would be these cases. So what if Peter, Paul, or Mary Jr. has creditor problems, right? the free spirit that is going to get in trouble, or the real estate speculator, or whatever. Because you don't want to inadvertently leave one of the kids' shares to the kids' creditors, right? Or what if, you know, what if they've got marital problems? What if one of the kids has marital problems? Because you don't want to inadvertently leave anything to the daughter-in-law you never liked in the first place, right? So, or the son-in-law, right? Or what if one of the kids has a disability? Because you don't want to inadvertently keep Peter, Paul, or Mary Jr. from qualifying for mass health, because you left them some money. Right? Um, and by the way, uh, disability does not mean having someone who's on SSDI, Social Security Disability Income. Social Security Disability Income, uh, it, like Social Security itself, there are no asset tests, right? You collect it by virtue of being disabled, no matter how much you have in other assets. SSI, on the other hand, Supplemental Security Income, does have an asset test. So in the case of those three possibilities, what you may want to do in all of those cases is the share that you were going to leave to your child, instead, leave it in trust for the benefit of your child. So if, you, if Mary were having creditor problems, you could leave her share in trust for the benefit of Mary. You could name Peter and Paul as the trustees. As long as Mary doesn't have the right to get the money out of that trust, then no creditor has the right to force the money to come out of the trust. Similarly with divorce and disability. You, you can, by naming, by being the third party and naming uh, someone as trustee for the benefit of one of your children, you are keeping those children eligible for mass health or for other government programs or for, or for housing, or for housing, right? Finally, there's the house. So if you simply leave the house to the kids or have no will, in which the case the house simply goes to the kids, the only problem with that is that you've really left the house to the kids, right? Which means that if the kids need to sell the house or want to sell the house, or some of them do and some of them don't, Everybody's got to agree, 100%, because each of them owns an interest in the house. And nobody can do anything unless everybody else is signed. Well, sometimes that's not a good idea, right? Even when the kids usually get along. Because if you leave them that Martha's Vineyard house, and two of them who live on the island think it's worth about 400000 but the one who lives in California has been reading the paper too much and thinks it's worth a million, you know, the house is never going to get sold. The only way they can sell the house in that case is to sub file something called a petition to partition real estate and have the court order the sale of the house. An ugly process in itself. It'll take you a year. It'll cost you a bunch of money, right? So in that case, what you may want to say in your will is, I want my house sold and the proceeds divided, right? Or if you've decided that you really want one of your children to stay in the house, you want to maybe say that in the will, right? I want my child to be able to stay in the house as long as he or she is paying the, the mortgage and the utilities and all of that other stuff. By the way, you don't want to simply say, I want my child to stay in the house. 
that's kind of a recipe for disaster, right? You want to make sure that the rules regarding how, how, on which they can stay in the house and whether they can rent it out and whether they, you know, all of these things should be spelled out. But all of those things could be appropriately put into a will. So what if you don't want to go through the probate process? And by the way, probate process, briefly, takes you a year to get through unless people are fighting. Um, the reason why it takes a year to get through is because if you die today, any creditor of yours has one year from the day of your death to file a claim against your estate to get paid. So if you get into a car accident today and you run over somebody but he survives but you die, right? And, and, and well, they can't sue you anymore because you're dead, right? But, but they can sue your estate from until one year from, the, from today. And after that, their claim is wiped out. It's actually, as far as third parties are concerned, it's actually called a short statute of limitations. Because if I ran over you and I lived, you would have three years to sue me. But if I run over you and I die, you only have a year to sue my estate. But from the perspective, of course, of the beneficiaries, it's a very long statute of limitations because everybody's got to wait for a year. So the, the moral is don't yell at your lawyer because you can't get out of probate in less than a year. It takes that long, okay? The other thing is cost. If no one's fighting, probate's going to cost you eh, three to six, seven thousand dollars That range, not a huge expense, right? It's actually gone down. Um, because the probate law got changed about three or four years ago. It used to be that for several of the pieces of the probate process, like getting the court to approve the will or getting the court to appoint the executor or getting the court to, to approve the final accounting at the end, you had to go to court. And that's what used to run up the legal bill because you had to hang around in court waiting for your two minutes of fame while you talk to the judge about, it, about this, this motion that no one's contesting. Well, all that's gone now. Um, a lot of these things you can just do by mail, and the things will get handled administratively, and that's why the cost is much lower. That said, if you want to avoid probate, one way is joint ownership, as we discussed with Frank and Mary. You can have, as long as, as, long as everything that you own at the time of your death is owned jointly with someone else, then once again, upon your death, your interest evaporates, the other person becomes the sole owner. So you're going to get, you're going to make it out of probate. Um, the most, the most common thing that holds people up, the most, most common little thing, is the car, right? The car, if it, is, if it is owned, even if it's owned by you, if you're Frank and you own the car, and you die and Mary's alive, actually Mary is presumed to be the joint owner. She doesn't actually have to be on the title as the joint owner. But if Mary then dies, no one is presumed to be the joint owner, and someone has to get, go through probate in order to get a, entitled to deal with the car. So if, if you want to take care of this, right, then name one of your kids as the joint owner. If they get really worried because, you know, they're afraid you're going to get into an accident, buy more insurance. That's all I can suggest. The, the other thing is, though, if you only have the car, there is a special kind of express route through the probate process available only if you die with an estate that's worth less than $25,000, not counting the car. So it's $25,000 plus the car. In those cases, you can file a fairly short form, cost you about $1,000, you get approved right away, and it's the last thing you have to do, right? But, so there's joint ownership. Um, there, there are life estates. Often, the big asset that forces you to go through probate is your home. So if you're just married, um, and you've got some kids, and you, and you, and you want to leave the house to the kids after you die, one possibility would be to actually transfer an interest in that house to the kids right now, and keep something called a life estate in the house. That is. You keep total control in the house until you die, but upon your death, your interest evaporates, leaving the kids as the sole owners of the property, right? Now, if you think they're then going to fight, right, you've got that problem that we talked about before, and so you may want to use a different route, right? But that's one possibility, um, and, and that's where you might use a trust, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, what about the stuff in the house? So I've been practicing, um, wow, 40 years. Next year, it'll be 40 years. I have yet to find a probate for case that was forced because anybody was arguing about the stuff in the house, right? So it may happen, but I'll just suggest to you that's, you know, you don't need to go through probate to deal with the stuff in the house. The only time you need to go through probate is if, you, if somebody needs to get appointed the personal representative so they can deal with the assets, so they can sign a deed, so they can sign the title to the car, so they can go to the bank and close the bank account. The stuff, no one's going to care about the stuff, you know, unless it's like a Picasso, unless you're selling something 
and the buyer wants to know the provenance, the so-called provenance of the, of, the, of the thing, where it came from, right? Because they want to show that you bought it from so-and-so who bought it from so-and-so who bought it from Picasso, right? But in the absence of that, you don't really need to do anything. If you want to just make sure that you're kind of clearing the air with your kids, you might want to write a letter to your kids, right? Or to the person, if you have a will, who is named as the personal representative, saying, here's how I want to leave all the stuff. Or, if you really, or you may want to do a bill of sale now, or a so-called chattel deed. My, my, uh, there are several of the lawyers hate that term, chattel deed. It's a, a chattel deed, it used to be that all things got conveyed by deed personal property as well as real estate, as well as slaves. And, and so slaves were transferred by chattel deed. And so some people still kind of recoil at the use of the term chattel deed, right? But that's technically what it is. If you're transferring any other property other than real estate, you're doing it by chattel deed, right? So there's, if, if you're concerned about that, or some people will simply say, they'll put it in their will, right? They'll say in their will, it is my, it's, it is my uh, intention that all of my assets will be divided up according to a little memorandum that I've done. And in the memorandum, they'll say to the kids, here's how you divide up the assets. And that way, if you die, and the, the kids see the memorandum, and they'll say, OK, so, and then the personal representative will say, OK, so we got a choice here. We can, we can file for probate and spend $5,000 and then divide up the property. Or we cannot file for probate and just divide up the property, right? And that way, there's no arguments. Everyone knows where things are going, and they just divide up the property. So probate avoidance you can do. One other alternative for avoiding probate is the revocable trust. Revocable or revocable. By the way, each, each of those ways of saying it is, is equally valid. You know, I've, lawyers have debated about this for a long time, but they're both valid. Um, so the easiest one, and some of you may have these, right? If you're doing probate avoidance, is Mary would name herself as the trustee of a trust. A trust is a relationship between two kinds of people, trustees and beneficiaries. The trustee is the legal owner for the benefit of the beneficiaries. Mary could name herself as the, benef as the trustee. She could name her kids as the beneficiaries of the house. And then she could transfer her house to herself as the trustee. Right? The nice thing about the trust, though, is that if Mary dies, she can simply name one of her kids as the successor trustee and then tell the child just what she would have said in the will. Go sell the house and divide up the proceeds. But because the will isn't going through, because the property isn't going through probate, it isn't going through an estate, Mary can literally sell the house the day after the mother dies. Right? Or Mary Jr. can. The, the daughter, the, whoever the successor trustee is, can immediately sell the property. Uh, such a trust has no tax implications. It is a so-called grantor taxable trust. So if you put your house in trust, for example, and then you go to sell it, that's OK. You still get your capital gains exemption, right? All, everything stays the same. It's also mass health countable. So if you're doing this in order to protect the house for mass health purposes, you did not succeed, right? I mention that because inevitably, and it happens twice so far this year, folks here on Martha's Vineyard, I've had two folks that showed me a trust, which the kids were sure was supposed to be protecting the house for mass health purposes, but the parents were sure was only taking care of making sure the house wouldn't go through probate. So they were grantor taxable trusts, which ended up being countable, which made the kids very upset, but that's what the trust said, OK? OK, now a little bit of MassHealth 101. MassHealth 101. What is MassHealth? Uh, it, is, it is the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program. It is the program that gets used by everybody who wants to go to, who wants to go to, who is stuck going to a nursing home, or who, because of their health, wants to stay at home and wants to benefit from a program of MassHealth called the Frail Elder Waiver, which will pay a lot of home care hours in order to keep you at home. So once again, we're back to Frank and Mary. They got $300,000. He's got an IRA. They got an annuity. They got bank accounts, right? So if Mary needs nursing home care um, and, and Frank is still at home, raise your hand if you think that um, that we need to that Frank needs to spend down some of this before Mary can qualify for Mass Health. Raise your hand if you think, oh, oh, now that's good. A lot of people have been coming. The answer to that is no. Nothing has to be spent down as long as the both of them are alive. And the reason for that is um, that the Mass Health regulations say that if you are trying to qualify for Mass Health because you need long-term care and you're in the nursing home, you have to show that you have less than two thousand dollars in countable assets. However, your spouse at home can own the home as long as it has an equity of less than $828,000, can, 
can have other cash or cash equivalent assets of up to $119,220. This number is about to go up, by the way, like this month. It'll go up to like $121,000, and the, and the house number will go up. It adjusts for inflation every year. Um, and the, the spouse at home, in this case Frank, can have unlimited um, income. And so what Mary would do in this case what, is we would transfer the home to Frank, not because we have to. Uh, Mary can be in the nursing home and still qualify for Mass Health while the two of them are alive. Um, um, and if she dies, Frank becomes the sole owner of the house. But we just do it to be on the safe side so that if Mary dies, the house will stay safe, okay? We transfer the house to, to, um, to excuse me, we transfer the house to Frank if Mary's in the nursing home. Um, we have to cash out, um, um, or no, and, and this is, in this case, this is Frank's IRA, so we don't even have to cash out the IRA. Um, we take the annuity in the bank accounts, plus some of the IRA money, to the extent that, that, that all those assets put together equal more than that number, $119,220, which they do. In this case, those assets add up to $325,000. In that case, we need to have Frank buy an annuity with all of the money over that number. Typically, we just round down and say, take all the money over $100,000. So he would buy an annuity for $225,000. As long as that annuity calls for equal monthly payments back to Frank over a term that is shorter than his actuarial life expectancy, and if Frank is 80 years old right now, his life expectancy is mm, about 10, 11 years, right? Then the purchase of that annuity in any amount, it can be $225,000, it can be $25,000, it can be a million dollars. Purchase of that annuity in any amount takes a countable asset, and turns it into a non-countable income stream. And remember, Frank can have unlimited income. So if Frank's got a million dollars, I mean, I've done that case. I've done that case here in Martha's Vineyard. Uh, if Frank's got a million dollars, he can if Mary can qualify for mass health. He's just got to go buy himself a big annuity. He ends up getting these huge monthly payments, right? But that's OK. And, and, and by the way, uh, Frank needs to have that amount of money only on the day that Mary qualifies for mass health. The day after Mary qualifies for Mass Health, Frank can have unlimited assets. He can hit the lottery, it doesn't make any difference. So you structure this always so that Frank is, you transfer all the money out and you make sure that the payments coming back to Frank are, um, when it, you, you make sure they don't end up causing him to be over that magic number before Mary qualifies for Mass Health. That's why you always uh, have him keep a smaller amount of money. But the bottom line is, Mary can always qualify for Mass Health if Frank's alive, right? However, um, the other things that, that Frank is going to do is he's going to change. He's going to change his will. Let's see. Yes. What he's going to do? He's going to change his will at that point. Although, by the way, Frank doesn't have to wait until this disaster has happened to change his will. I often tell people here that one of the things that you may want to do if you're concerned about these issues, Frank Frank wants to make sure that his will says that upon his death. The assets that would have gone to Mary, and remember that was his goal, right? Was when he died, everything went to Mary. When she died, everything went to Frank. <coughs> Frank wants to say that everything that would have gone to Mary will instead go in trust for Mary's benefit. In trust for Mary's benefit. It has to be a testamentary trust. That is a trust that is part of the will. And he can name any one of his kids or all of his kids as the trustees. They can have the discretion to distribute as much money, as much of that money back to Mary as they want, right? And that's why, when, you know, when you're setting things like this up, I always say that's why they call them trusts. You have to trust, you, you would do this if you trust your kids, right? If you would, Frank trusts that if he dies, that whoever he's naming as the trustee will, if the, you know, mother, if mom needs some money, right, give it to her, right? So the kids can have the total discretion to transfer funds to the mother, right, to Mary, but none of the assets count. None of those assets count. So if Frank dies and all these assets are going into trust for Mary's benefit, as long as they're still in trust, they don't count, Mary can immediately qualify for Mass Health. So you want to change, they want, she, Frank wants to change his will. Um, and, and, and at this point, of course, Frank's got all the assets in his name. So he knows that if he dies, everything's going to be safe. You always want to have powers of attorney, right? You want to make sure that that's done ahead of time because this whole thing doesn't work, right? If Mary's in the nursing home, and Frank's still at home, but we can't shift the assets from Mary to Frank because for some reason there's an asset that's just in Mary's name and Frank doesn't have power of attorney. So you always need a power of attorney, right? Um, in, in, in many cases, couples, no, I shouldn't say in many cases, in some cases, 
in cases where one spouse is older than the other by a lot, or where one spouse has like a heart condition, there's some likelihood that that spouse is more at risk than the other spouse of just dropping dead before things can be shifted around. Um, spouses will shift these assets early, and they'll stack the assets in the name of the person who is older or who has the heart problem, right? Otherwise, you really don't have to, because if the wills are correct, if Frank and Mary each have wills saying, when I die, everything goes in trust for the benefit of my spouse, they can shift their assets around. They can wait till the last minute to shift their assets around, okay? Um, this does not work, though, if Frank has died, and Mary then goes to the nursing home, and she has inherited everything, right? Because now, or if, or if Mary is now trying to do this kind of planning, because this happens, by the way, once again regularly, Every, every month I'll have talked to a couple of people that their spouse just died and now they've decided that they really want to make sure everything is safe in case they need nursing home care, right? And I'll say, well, you know, you're a little late, you know? If, the, if we had done this before your spouse died, everything would be safe right now, right? But if that hasn't happened and now we just have Mary and there are Mary's assets again, remember? Um, in that case, Mary's options are more limited. This is where the famous five-year look-back period comes in, right? All of the things that I talked to you about before, about shifting assets between spouses, the five-year look-back period doesn't apply to any of that. And that's why you can wait till one spouse goes into the nursing home, shift everything at the last minute, right? If Mary, though, is trying to preserve any of these assets in the event that she needs nursing home care, she has to, she has to lose control over them and wait five years. She can do that in a couple of different ways. Literally, she could just give her house away to the kids right now if she's concerned about saving the house. Or she could give her house away, but if she wants to make sure they don't throw her out, she can keep a life estate in the house so she can keep control of it while she's alive, right? Uh, or uh, if she is, if she, um, but the only issue with doing that is that if she gives the house, this interest in the house to her kids, called the remainder interest, and keeps the life estate because she wants this protection for later on, but then she wants to sell the house, right? Well, she can, except that, except that, first of all, the buyer is going to need a deed from everybody, from her and from the people who own the, life, who own the, uh, the remainder interest, from the kids. I have a family, I had a couple in Oak Bluffs who had sold their house, um, or who had transferred their house, the remainder interest in the house, to their four kids 25 years ago, right? Because they moved here, they lived in Boston, and they moved here. Um, and, but now they're still in very good health. They're like in their mid 80s, but you know, money's a little short, you know, and they've got this house. It's an Oak Bluffs, it's two blocks from the beach, nice house, right? And so they'd like to sell it and move back to Boston, right? And three of their four kids are willing to sign that deed, <laughs> but not the fourth one. So it's just why they called me and they said, so what can we do? And I said, nothing. There's not a thing you can do about that. Nothing, right? You can't do a petition to partition and force the sale of the house, right? because all you own is the life estate portion, which is worth about 25% of the value of the house. So the house will get sold, but you won't get all the money. And that's the point, right? You want all the money so you can cash out, right? So sometimes that's not a good idea. Um, and also, if the house has to get sold in that situation, after you've deeded the remainder interest to the kids, uh, the, the remainder interest, which if Frank and Mary are 80 years old, the remainder interest is worth about 75% nah, of the value of the house. The life estate's worth about 25. The remainder interest does not get to take the benefit of the, 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 uh, the, the home ownership deduction, which you all have, that everybody knows those numbers, $250,000 a person that you get to reduce your capital gains by. So you take a capital gains hit. That's the reason why in many of these cases, people will transfer their home to the trustee of an irrevocable trust and in name as the trustee, the child that you trust the most, so that you know if you're gonna go sell the house, you're not gonna have any problem getting a deed signed, right? And you put certain terms into that trust so as to make, so, so that for IRS purposes, um, the trust uh, is, is still considered to be grantor taxable, it's still yours, so that when you go to sell the house, you won't have to pay the capital gains. Now, I'm just gonna spend a little more time on this because these are the kinds of trusts that you've all heard have been getting people into trouble, right? People have transferred property into an irrevocable trust and waited the five years and then gone to the nursing home and there have been increasing numbers of cases where the caseworkers at MassHealth have said, no, that house is still countable because it's, it's in a trust 
But the trust rules are, stu are such that the older person still has control of that house, right? And the reason why I meant, and, and that's become, we've become all very sensitized to that. I'm sure you've heard about it, or many of you have. That's the reason why I passed around the case that you just got. Uh, that case is called Hein or H-E-Y-N versus Medicaid. You want to read that case? First of all, just because it's reading a law case. You actually get to read one of these cases, right? And, and it's a case just got decided two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago. And it's an irrevocable trust case. And it's an irrevocable trust case that is actually beneficial to you. Um, there have been a set of cases up to this point that have made a lot of us more and more nervous about using irrevocable trusts. There are, there are two or three things that are interesting about the irrevocable trust into which the lady in this case had transferred her house, uh, which were challenged by Mass Health, and the challenge was upheld by the Superior Court, but, this in, but in this case it went all the way up to the Appeals Court, and the Appeals Court reversed and said, no, this irrevocable trust was okay. So I'm just going to mention a couple of them. Um, one, the trustee of this irrevocable trust retained, the trustee was one of the kids, retained the ability to make distributions of the trust principle or of any asset that was in trust to the kids. And the reason why I mention this is that just about all these irrevocable trusts have a provision just like that. So it gives the trustee the ability, who is typically one of your kids, to make a distribution to themselves, right? or to one of the other children, so that they can turn around and give the money back to you. It's called a back door or a side door, right? Um, now, there are some of these irrevocable trusts where things have gotten even more aggressive over time and where lawyers said, well, you know, you can really have your cake and eat it too. You can set up this irrevocable trust and you transfer your assets into it, but you keep the power to make those distributions if you want to, to your kids so that you know that the kids aren't going to just, without your consent, just distribute some money, right? That kind of provision has been, has been deemed to cause the stuff that's in trust to become a countable asset. And I still think that that provision is in trouble. I think that case hasn't gone to an appeals court yet, but I think that provision is in trouble. Um, there is also a provision that is in a number of these trusts that allows the parents, or the, or the mother or the father, to continue to live in the house without cost, right, for the rest of their life. I think that can get you into trouble too. Right? I think those are the two provisions that can get you into trouble. But in this case, the provision that simply says that a trustee, like one of your kids, has the right at any time to make a distribution to one of the other kids of any amount is not going to get you in trouble. And that's what this, what this document said. There was another provision that had been, there was another um, kind of provision that had been, had been looked at by MassHealth where the Mass Health caseworkers were saying, well, you know, it says in the trust that none of the trust principle can be distributed, right? But in the trust, it often says that income can be distributed. And so the trustee in this case, even if the only asset is a house, could always sell the house, go buy an annuity, an annuity is considered to be income. Remember, we talked about annuities before. They're considered to be income. And therefore, convert the asset from principal into income, and therefore, the house should always be counted. Well, the court in this case said, that's going too far, right? That's just going too far. The mere fact that the trustee has the ability to do that with the house will not cause the assets to be countable. So you, be, you may be entertained or not. I mean, it's, one, it's only one case. But read the case. It gives you a sense, though, that irrevocable trusts are still usable, right? But you want to be really careful about them. And if you've got an existing one, you should have somebody check it. Because the very same irrevocable trust that was perfectly good five years ago may not be today. Just because the rules have gotten tighter, because there have been more challenges, and, and trusts are never grandfathered. The fact that you had done it five or ten years ago makes no difference. The question is, what are the mass health rules now, not what were the mass health rules then? So, that's about irrevocable trust. The other thing you can do is you can, for other assets, when we, it, it, my suggestion to folks always, if you're doing, using, doing something other than the house and you want to transfer assets to the kids and wait five years, is that's what you really want to do. You want to transfer the assets to the kids. Transfer the money to the kids. Have them turn around and create a trust, right? Naming themselves as the beneficiaries so that you're just sure that if you don't make it past the five years, you know where the money is, you can get it back, right? But let them create the trust. The, the reason for that is that when you're filing your MassHealth application, 
if there was a trust that you created, no matter how long ago, you have to file that along with the application. Whereas if you give their, your assets to your kids and then they create the trust, then five years later, if you go to apply for Mass Health, you don't have to file the trust, right? So you're not ever having to kind of show your hands, your hand regarding where the money went. Because as far as Mass Health is concerned, in that case, you just gave the money to your kids. You didn't give the money to a trust. So that's her asset protection trend. And that's what we just talked about. Hein versus Medicaid. Annuity purchases, the PowerPoint we talked about, this replacement property thing is also this, there's a, nah, I won't go through that, that's boring. Um, so, the one thing to remember though, remember we were going back to the Frank and Mary asset protection plan where we said, well, you know, if you want to protect your spouse in the event that you die, you need to change your will to say that all of your assets upon your death will go in trust for the benefit of your spouse. That will has to get probated. So, if the two of you are alive and you're trying to protect your spouse, you cannot protect her or him and also avoid probate. People always come in and of course they like to do both, but you can't because the federal Medicaid loophole, and I'll call it that, right, that allows for this to happen makes it specific that the trust involved has to be a testamentary trust, a trust that is part of the will. On the other hand, if Mary transfers her home to an irrevocable trust and keeps a life estate in the property, transfers the other assets to her kids and to her an irrevocable trust, then by having done all of those things, she will also have avoided probate because she will have transferred all of her, she'll have just kept a life estate. Remember we talked about keeping a life estate allows you to avoid probate. And then the other assets she will have just given away. So she will have avoided probate. One more thing, one more thing, big deal. Um, outside section 11, anybody hear about outside section 11 yet? Raise your hand if you've heard of outside section 11. Oh no, that's not enough. So <clears throat> the, to understand, Governor, Governor Baker's budget uh, contains a number of outside sections, which all budgets contain. Budgets, you would think, you know, the normal person would think of a budget is it's just a bunch of lists of numbers, right? So it's like, here's what I want to do, here's how much we're going to spend. Here's what I want to do, here's what we're going to spend. Except that but the state budget often also contains in it so-called outside sections, sections that while they're not like that, they don't just say, here's what I'm going to do, here's what I'm going to spend. They have a fiscal impact. So for example, you could have an outside section that changes eligibility rules for a state government program, which will have an effect because you change the rules and therefore you estimate that the cost of the program is going to be different. Or in this case, <clears throat> you have rules that are meant to expand MassHealth's right to recover assets um, regarding a person who's been on MassHealth, which it is argued will help reduce the Medicaid budget, which as you, you all may know is the biggest line item in the, in the state budget right now, so it's a source of much concern. Uh, so the current law is that if Mary goes into the nursing home and Frank is still alive, then upon her death, MassHealth, and MassHealth paid for her bill, upon her death, MassHealth has a lien uh, against um, or the right to recover against her probate assets. Well, her probate assets aren't very much because remember, she can only have $2,000 in order to qualify for Mass Health. So that's not going to be a big deal. Uh, if, if, Mary, if Frank were dead and Mary had qualified for Mass Health, she could have kept the house. I mentioned, to that, I mentioned that earlier that you can keep the house. Um, it's not a countable asset except Mass Health will put a lien on the house, right? Uh, and so that, and then upon her death, Mass Health would have a lien on the house, and the house could get collected. But except for that lien, um, Mass Health has no rights to collect regarding money that has been paid on your behalf. So, if, for example, remember I gave you that example: if, if Mary goes into the nursing home and she owns the house with Frank, and they own it jointly, actually she doesn't have to transfer the house to him presently, because if she dies, he simply becomes the owner of the house. And there's no lien on the house because the lien only appears if Frank has died first and she's the sole owner. Um, similarly, if, she is, if Mary has transferred a, an interest to her kids in the house, she transferred this remainder interest but kept a life estate, well, if she then goes into the nursing home five years later, MassHealth will have a lien on the life estate, but following her death, that lien will evaporate because her life estate evaporates. And then, of course, after Mary has died, MassHealth has no claim uh, to ch keep chasing Frank or on Frank's estate, 
or at least it doesn't now. But all those things are going to change. So um, we, I explained to you what an outside section is. What this particular outside section would do, outside section 11, is it would say, first of all, if you own any interest in real estate, even though it's a joint interest, like Mary's interest together with Frank, or if it's a life estate, upon your, and, Ma and you are a qualified for Mass Health, and Mass Health you know, pays money on your behalf, upon your death, Mass Health will have a lien against that property uh, up to the value of your interest in the property the moment before you die. So in the case of the house owned by Frank and Mary, uh, it's assu assumed when you own property jointly that you each own half of it. If the law were to change and, and Mary were to go into a nursing home and they left their house in joint names upon Mary's death, um, Mass Health would have a claim for $150,000 against that house or a claim for half of whatever the value was at the time that Mary died. Or if Mary had transferred her house and kept a life estate, if Mary is 80 years old, her life estate is worth about 25% of the value of the house, Mass Health will have a claim for that 25%. But even more significant than that to me is that when Frank then dies at some later date, a day later, a year later, 10 years later, even if he's remarried, moved out of state, doesn't make any difference, Mass Health will have a claim against his probate estate for the entire amount that they paid on Mary's behalf before she died. That is a big change. Right? Um, the reason why I mention those two things is that they are part of the governor's budget. And as opposed to most legislation that gets proposed in the legislature, and you know, if they, they make a big deal out of proposing it, but nothing ever passes. And not nothing, you know, one out of a hundred bills that go to the legislature pass. The budget, though, always passes. Some kind of budget will pass. Whether it will have outside Section 11 in it, not sure, right? But it will be a budget that will pass, and it'll pass by July, like in two months, right? So this is something you should pay attention to. You should talk to your lawyer about it to make sure someone's paying attention. You may want to talk to your rep and your senator about it. Although I would mention to you that the way a budget gets passed is the governor proposes it, and then it goes to the House of Representatives and the Senate. And then the Senate develops its own version of the budget. They send it to their House Ways and Means Committee, and House Ways and Means makes a recommendation back to the full House, and then the House votes it. And then the Senate Ways and Means Committee looks at the budget, and they make recommendations back to the Senate, and the Senate votes their version. And if the two versions are different, which they always are, then there's a conference committee that between the two houses, and they send representatives from both houses, and they argue about it, and they come up to a budget. Right? The reason why that's of significance is that the House Ways and Means Committee, that was kind of step one in what I just said, their recommended budget, which they referred back to the full house, dropped outside Section 11. We think because a whole lot of people were aware of this, among other things because me and a lot of other lawyers have told people about this, right? Um, and so it's, it was dropped. Now, as to whether the House, the full House, will, will keep it dropped, we don't know that yet. The House hasn't voted, right? As to, if the House, if it's not part of the House budget, and it's also not part of the Senate budget, then it's dead. If it's, part of the, if it's not part of the House budget, but it's still in the Senate budget, then it gets decided in conference committee when they, the two houses decide which one they're going to do, right? So you should talk to your lawyer. Um, if you've already put something like this in place or you're bothered by this, you may want to talk to your representative or your senator, right? Because this is purely a function. The, the governor continues to support this, despite what the House Ways and Means Committee just recommended. The governor continues to support this. So you want to pay attention to this. This could have a big, big effect on you, it will only apply to, but oh, it will only apply to people who are, who become Mass Health members as of after the budget passes, like July of 2016. So it's not going to affect people who are already on Mass Health, but it's going to affect everybody who's got these interests, no matter when after that that you apply. So you want to pay attention to that. So um, if you're just thrilled about this presentation, but you can't remember everything I said, you can always go back to Frank and Mary's YouTube channel and watch it on YouTube. Uh, and remember, the goal of life is to sleep well at night. And so hopefully this helps you at least understand what the issues are. Thank you. Any questions? We went through a lot of stuff. Yes, ma'am? Is the MOLST an actual form, or does it have to be written Is the MOLST an actual form? Yes. Uh, the D Department of Public Health has generated this form. You could find it by going on the Department of Health Public Health website or calling your doctor, because the Department of Public Health 
has been really aggressive about getting to general practitioners and encouraging them to talk to people about this. As a matter of fact, CMS, the, the, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, the federal agency that runs Medicare, actually just authorized payment to your doctor for talking to you about this. This was one of the issues before, was that doctors, general practitioners who were stressed enough, right? Yeah. Medicare wasn't paying them to talk to their patients about these issues. It was stupid. And so they finally changed that, right? And so doctors are now just more interested in taking the 15 minutes or half an hour. So you should do it. Talk to your doctor. And, and if you can, bring with you the child, often it's the child, who is your proxy, right? To talk, to help, to, so they all, everybody's on the same page, okay? Other questions? Any others? Uh, what? Yes, ma'am, and then we'll come back in the case there's any other. Yes, ma'am. If your house is in a trust and you're the trustee, is it in your name? Yes, it is in your name as trustee, as trustee of that trust. And you probably did that in order to avoid probate. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. I don't know. But you probably did that to avoid probate, which means it will, right, as long as your successor trustee is in there someplace, right, as the person who's going to succeed you. It's grantor taxable, so it hasn't affected your tax status at all. And it's, and it's still a countable asset for mass health purposes if you need mass health. Okay? Other questions? Uh, yes, ma'am? Just briefly, what's the difference between a revocable and irrevocable trust? A revocable trust is one, and the, different, and the real distinction you want is between revocable versus irrevocable and unamendable, right? A revocable trust, typically also amendable, is one over which you keep control as well as the ability to revoke it, to simply walk away from that trust. The, 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 the legal rule is that if, you, if a trust is simply that the assets that you put into trust, right, unless you have specifically said otherwise, you can always take back, right, in addition to whatever the rules in the trust say about how to handle the trust assets. A revocable trust is one where you can take the assets back, thereby revoking the trust, as opposed to an irrevocable one. So by, by having assets in an irrevocable trust, you do not necessarily have those assets protected. Because in order for them to be protected, not only does the trust have to be irrevocable, but you can't be the trustee, and there have to be certain controls regarding your ability to get any of those assets, right? And there has to be something in that trust that says that it can't be amended by you, right? Or, in a, or by the trustee in a way that's going to allow you to get to the assets. So often, the, the people don't quite understand that distinction. They'll just say, oh, it's irrevocable. Everything is safe. Well, no. Actually, it has to be irrevocable, and these other rules have to be in there. Yes, ma'am? If you have a trust, yeah. and you have, say, four children, yeah. uh, the trustees, yeah. you want them to sell the house after you die, for instance. Three of the kids want to sell, one doesn't. What happens? So they can't sell. So your question is, what happens if you have a trust and you have four children, but they're all the trustees of the trust? Right. And the rule says right. after, after you die, the trustees have got to agree on how to sell the house, right? Does everybody have to agree? Well, fortunately, as long as you've set a rule in the trust that says, for example, it's a majority decision, right? then as long as it's three to one, you can sell the house, right? That's the advantage of having those four kids act as trustees versus just transferring the house to them individually, in which case but everybody ha would have to agree on all the decisions. Okay. So it's yeah. totally governed by the rules that are in the trust. Yeah. Okay, so if they decide, three of them decide to sell and one doesn't, and they can't sell. No, I, what I was saying was, go read, go read the trust. The trust may very well say, right, that, that if there's a disagreement, yeah. that it's majority rule, or that there's some way of resolving it. And by the way, this gets to a very interesting point. Never, ever, ever do a trust with an even number of trustees, <laughs> right, <laughs> unless you have a tiebreaker. As I, I, I have... Oftentimes, that's me. I, tell, I always tell people, never make me the trustee. I'm way too expensive. But make me the tiebreaker so that if your trustees can't agree, I'll break the tie. 
I have been named the tiebreaker in hundreds and hundreds of cases. I've never been asked to break a tie. As soon as people know they have to pay the tiebreaker, they figure it out. <laughs> I think that's it. Thank you very much for coming, and we'll see you in the fall. Thank you all.